One, two, three, four, let's go. It's hardly. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. I heard be Alaska. It's hardly. Oh! <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. Everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you for joining us once again for this very important program. Important for many reasons. I hope you stay tuned because it is packed with information. On today's program recently, a tribal forum was held in Anchorage to address regionalization and consolidation issues that could directly affect almost every village in Alaska. The tribal leaders met to voice their concerns. You'll see that and much more on today's program. The Tribal Forum has been called by tribal leaders that are very concerned about the uh, recent developments towards regionalizing federal funding. And what that has been has been the forced consolidation of dollars that instead of going directly to the tribes and tribal governments, have been directed towards nonprofit corporations. What that does is it impacts tribal sovereignty, impacts the ability of tribes to be self-determining. They are in the best position to make the decisions regarding how funds should be spent, for instance, in, in HUD housing, who should be a, a person who needs their house to be um, renovated versus who should be a person that uh, has uh, on a waiting list to get a house built. So this is about how to deal with what is increasingly becoming uh, a, a trend. And, and to examine closely and discuss closely how this is going to impact upon decision making at the local level, how it's going to impact upon tribal sovereignty in general, and then what, if anything, can tribal leaders do about it? Well, the implications of regionalization, you know, are significant on at least two different levels. The first level is that our tribe, as a federally recognized tribe, has the right to contract directly with the federal government for programs that were intended for the benefit of Alaska Native people. And so our people have that right pursuant to the Self-Determination Act of 1975. And right now we're exerc exercising that right by bringing in funds, programs into our tribal community and hiring our own people and providing a significant amount of job opportunities for people as well as training, education for our young people who want to go to college. And so on, on the funding level, it's a major threat when Senator Stevens is passing riders on the bills that's directly cutting funds that go to our tribes. The rider Yvonne Peters was referring to was passed last January. Currently, an Alaska Rural Justice and Law Enforcement Commission has been established to review federal, state, local, and tribal jurisdiction over civil and criminal matters in Alaska. The creation of a unified law enforcement system could essentially take tribal law enforcement out of the villages and regionalize it. This could eliminate VPSOs and VPOs in our rural villages. At the 2003 Alaska Federation of Natives Convention, Senator Stevens addressed the people through a letter regarding sovereignty issues. The following are excerpts from Senator Stevens' letter. Tribal sovereignty is not the answer to the problems Alaska Natives face. It merely brings authority to some, power to others, and legal fees to advocates that bring incessant litigation. Full sovereignty is only possible by turning your lands back to the federal government to hold in trust for you. You can make no decisions about your land without Uncle Sam's permission. It is just not possible to fund 231 separate villages as tribes. The time is fast approaching when I will no longer be chairman of the Appropriations Committee and someday I will not be in the Senate to represent you. When that day comes, the current funding levels will not be sustainable. Already, tribes in the lower 48 are using the new census figures to take almost 10% of Alaska Native housing funds in 2004. 
Through a conversation with Senator Stevens' press secretary, we were assured that Senator Stevens is not trying to take funding from the villages, but instead believes that regionalization will allow large amounts of funding to be spent in the different regions of the state instead of on the infrastructure of each village. This method, he believes, will serve the people of each region at a better level. However, the many tribes of rural Alaska see things a little differently. Having control of how federal funding is spent in each village is a village matter and would inevitably affect the people and their livelihood, as well as the jobs and the economy of each village. There's, um, uh, you know, between 20 and 30 uh, employees, not including the um, water sewer and others. Uh, I think we have uh, around 50 to 60 employees uh, right now um, running all the programs and um, also our um, gaming program. But if the regionalization happens, uh, then uh, we go backwards and then uh, the money goes to uh, a regional nonprofit. If it's a funding uh, thing, then we would le lose uh, um, uh, some of the uh, employees in my community, and uh, and I think it would uh, it would uh, have uh, bad economic impact, and we'll get back to dependency of services uh, <clears throat> uh, if we go uh, the way. Uh, I'm thinking that Senator uh, Stevens has in mind. So I think we as NATO people have really not done a good job in educating members of Congress, members of the state government, governor, and the legislature about the benefits that tribes have brought to the state of Alaska. I mean, to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funds, but not only that, some really res true results that can be measured at the village level. There's no doubt that regionalization will have a profound effect upon all Alaskans. We'll be learning more about regionalizations in the upcoming programs with updates for you. I'll be back with more Heartbeat Alaska right after this. Flying in Alaska? Fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service is the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. Dear Richard, Dear Richard this is really hard to write. Dear Richard, people are starting to talk about you. I'm sorry, but I have to say something. Hey. Uh, call me later, okay? Dear Richard, Dear Richard, please, just listen. It takes a lot of guts to talk to your friends about their problems with marijuana or drinking, but it could make all the difference. In the 1890s, pioneers carved a railway through the rugged mountains between Skagway and the Klondike. More than a century later, the White Pass and Yukon route still makes this legendary run. Along the way, life has gotten better for folks working on the railroad, thanks in part to Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska, a health plan that's offered smart choices and quality coverage to the people of Alaska since before it was a state. Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We're here. We're with you. Tribal status has had a profound history throughout the ages for our Native Americans and Alaska Natives. Let's take a look at some of that history, going all the way back to ANGSA. Alaska Statehood and the Impact of Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act is brought to you by the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation.
It was March 30th, 1867, when the United States purchased Alaska from Russia. The two nations agreed that the United States would pay Russia $7.2 million. At less than two cents an acre, the United States acquired nearly 600,000 square miles. Ninety-two years would pass before the territory of Alaska would achieve statehood. Judge James Wickersham proposed the first statehood bill to Congress in 1916. The discovery of the Swanson River oil field in the 1950s finally gave the territory the tax base it needed to become a state. A constitutional convention was held to develop a state constitution and a statehood act was passed in 1959. Unfortunately for the native community, the statehood act did not effectively address or preserve native lands or rights. The Inupiat Eskimos of Alaska's North Slope, realizing that the state of Alaska intended to claim and develop the oil-rich lands of the Arctic Slope, formed the Arctic Slope Native Association, ASNA, in 1965. ASNA's membership claimed Aboriginal title to 56.5 million acres of the petroleum-rich lands encompassing the entire North Slope of Alaska. The Alaska Federation of Natives, AFN, was formed in 1966 to pursue the land claims and the native rights settlement with the federal and state governments. Also in 1966, the claims filed by ASNA resulted in a land freeze issued by the Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall. The land freeze prevented the transfer of further lands granted to the state of Alaska by the Statehood Act. Udall's land freeze brought an angry response from the state officials. In 1967, Alaska Governor Wally Hickel initiated a lawsuit to force the transfer of lands. Governor Hickel demanded the lifting of the land freeze because the freeze prevented the issuance of oil leases on federal lands. Because the state was to receive 90% of royalty revenues from such lands, the state claimed it was losing significant revenues. On March 13, 1968, Arco and Humble Oil Refining Company, which would later become Exxon, announced the discovery of oil at Prudhoe Bay. The industry and the government began plans for an 800-mile Trans-Alaska pipeline. But native land claims cast a clout over ownership of land and leases in Alaska. How would pipeline access be gained over land claimed by native groups? Compensation would have to be decided and a settlement had to be reached with the native people whose land and lives were about to be changed forever. For four long years, spirited debate would be focused on just how much land Alaska natives would retain and how much cash they would be granted for the extinguishment of their claims to the land. In 1969, the state of Alaska auctioned lease rights to Prudhoe Bay, generating $900 million. Inupiat and other Alaska natives, led by Charles Etook Edwardson, Jr., protested this sale by the state of what they considered to be Arctic Slope Inupiat resources.
In 1970, AFN and ASNA increased lobbying efforts in Washington, D.C. for congressional legislation to settle Alaska Native land claims. The huge oil discovery provided the first real incentive and opportunity to reach a federally legislated land claim settlement. The push to build a pipeline from the oil riches discovered at Prudhoe Bay across the state, including lands claimed by Alaska Native groups, would finally lead to a settlement. The Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, ANCSA, is signed into law by President Nixon. The delegates from ASNA voted against supporting the act and in the end were the only regional native organization which openly opposed the act. Prior to the passage of ANCSA, the U.S. Congress wanted Alaska Native support and approval of the final act. The AFN gathered delegates from all regions of the state to vote. The Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act was eventually approved by a majority vote of AFN delegates, with only the Arctic Slope delegates opposed. You may ask why Alaska Natives were organized under the corporate form. First, influential Alaska Native leaders and groups wanted to be independent in managing their land and affairs. They were dissatisfied with federal Indian programs. They thought something better than being in a trust relationship and being made wards of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, should be found. Second, the state and influential members of Congress wanted to prevent establishment of any additional reservations or Indian country in Alaska. Indian country has significant federal protection and almost complete exemption from state government authority. The corporate form would ensure that any new native entities in Alaska would be subject to state of Alaska jurisdiction. ANCSA authorized the formation of 12 regional native corporations and approximately 200 native village corporations. Later, an additional regional corporation, the 13th Regional Corporation, would be authorized and formed for the benefit of Alaska natives who lived outside of Alaska at the time of the passage of the act. The final version of ANCSA would provide for the payment of $962 million and the transfer of 44 million acres of land to the various native corporations formed pursuant to ANCSA. Out of this amount, $500 million would be generated by oil royalties from the North Slope lands, formerly claimed by the Inupiaq people, and the remainder would come from the federal treasury. ANCSA also contains language requiring regional corporations to distribute 70% of all natural resource revenues among the regional corporations. This provision is called 7i and has generated much litigation regarding exactly what must be distributed. Eligibility and enrollment into regional corporations pursuant to ANCSA is restricted to any Alaskan native of at least a quarter native blood live on December 18, 1971. ANCSA excluded anyone born after December 18, 1971, afterborns. However, in 1991, amendments to ANCSA authorized the creation of additional stock to include afterborns as native corporation shareholders. Each of the regional corporations was given the option to issue additional shares of stock to those afterborn upon the approval of the majority of existing shareholders. Soon after the adoption of these amendments, several ANCSA corporations authorized the enrollment of afterborns, who are now included as shareholders. The Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act is sometimes referred to as a living document and is periodically revised to reflect the changing landscape in Alaska and the needs of the Alaska Native community. For Alaska Natives, weaving our lives through today's modern times, through today's politics and westernizations. Trying to live our lives by other people's laws has never been easy. 
Let's take a look now at the Inupiat people of the North Slope area of the Arctic region and go back to their values that made them strong, that carry us through these rough times. Love and respect for our elders and one another. Our elders model our traditions and ways of being. They are a light of hope to younger generations. May we treat each other as our elders have taught us. Respect for nature. Our creator gave us the gift of our surroundings. Those before us placed ultimate importance on respecting this magnificent gift for their future generations. Compassion. Though the environment is harsh and cold, our ancestors learned to live with warmth, kindness, caring, and compassion. Humility. Our hearts command we act on goodness, expect no reward in return. This is part of our cultural fiber. Humor. Indeed, laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> Cooperation. Together, we have an awesome power to accomplish anything. Cooperation, what does it mean in Inupiaq society? All of these many hundreds and thousands of years, cooperation has been a value that we as Inupiaq people have used to enable us to survive. Cooperating with one another in our hunting, in our everyday lives has given us the skills and tools that we need in order to come this far. Sharing. It is amazing how sharing works. Your acts of giving always come back. My name is James Spudkodak, and I will translate into English what Isaac Akuchik says when he talks about sharing. Mr. Akuchik says, we have words to give to you on what we have learned from our ancestors uncles and parents. He says that God gave his only son to all people so that we can have everlasting life while on this earth. That is where sharing comes into play from the beginning. Now today, people are working on this important value, speaking about how we live and how we do our jobs or share food with people that are in need. People that like to share what they have seem to have more than others who don't. We know that sharing is very good to have in our lives. We have heard and probably experienced ourselves that being unable to share with other people brings poverty to oneself. Mr. Akuchuk stresses to you, do not let that happen because as Inupiaq, we must share in our lives, whether it be jobs or leadership in our villages. That is what we are talking about in the value of sharing. Family and kinship. As Inupiaq people, we believe in knowing who we are and how we are related to one another. Our families bind us together.
Knowledge of language. With our language, we have an identity. It helps us to find out who we are in our mind and in our heart. Heavenly Father, we ask you right now to keep that ice. Even though it looks Spirituality. We know the power of prayer. We are a spiritual people. Avoidance of conflict. The Inupiaq way is to think positive, act positive, speak positive, and live positive. I'm going to talk about the avoidance of conflict as I was taught by my parents. When there is a conflict, one does not really avoid it. We resolve it with the help of elders to reach the decision. We do not keep arguing and arguing about something. It has to be solved. Once it is solved, it is over. We do not hold a grudge against someone for a long period of time. We begin to lead our lives with renewed spirit and start over again. The decision is usually made for the good of community. One does not make a decision just for himself or herself, but for the good of community. We need to live together and cooperate in order to survive. Thank you everyone for joining us for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. I thank you for joining us. If you are not familiar with Alaska Natives in their ways, and you're non-native, we welcome you to watch this program. It's education for you and for everyone else. And I believe that's the greatest way to fight fear is through education because fear after all is lack of knowledge. God bless every single one of you. Join me again for more Heartbeat Alaska next week. It's hard to Alaska.